Hi. My, <laughs> my name's Evan. I'm an alcoholic. I've been kept sober since September 25th of 98, and I'm grateful to be here today. I haven't been to this meeting in, gosh, like five years, maybe. Um, so it's nice to see your faces again and, and be back in this room. Um, you know, my story is pretty, pretty simple. It's nothing terribly unique, but, um, but it's mine. And I, uh, I was born and raised in Dallas and, um, I remember, you know, my, one of my first memories as a little girl, I think I was probably three or four years old was being in, um, a department store with my mom and my sister. I have one older sister and, um, kind of on purpose dragging behind and seeing, and my, my whole point was, you know, are they going to even notice if I'm gone? And, you know, I'm probably 10, 15 feet behind max, but, um, and you know, my mom of course knew where I was, but to me it was like, they don't even care that I'm next to them. And that was kind of like that memory always has made me really sad that, um, that's just kind of how I came into the world. I didn't ever really feel like I fit or that I mattered um, or that I was supposed to even be here or that anyone really cared. Um, you know, and I don't know what that is, if that's genetics, if that's depression, if that's alcoholism, if that's, um, I had a pretty serious surgery when I was five months old and maybe the trauma from that made me feel different. You know, who knows? It doesn't really matter. The point is that those are the feelings that stayed with me from childhood, early childhood. And uh, my sister's one of those people that she's great and she's completely, well, she's not completely normal, but <laughs> she's definitely got her issues, but that's, or it's not about her today. Um, <laughs> she, uh, she always did everything right, you know. She never questioned anything. She she just kind of did what she was told and did what she was supposed to do. And I was never like that. I was always, you know, you need to put that dress on. Well, why? You know, I need to know why. Why do I have to do any of this? Um, and, and, you know, that makes for um, life on life's terms to be, pretty far away and just, you know, always questioning everything and not really trusting anything. Um, and I always thought my first drink was when I was 12 years old, but my mom told me about six months ago that my first drink, I was actually six years old and I never knew this story. Um, and apparently I had snagged a bottle of, um, beer, a Budweiser from my dad and, went and hid behind the sofa and I was just drinking it and chugging it behind the sofa. And I'm like, that is hilarious. I had no idea that I had done that. Um, but that theme pervaded in my drinking as well, the sort of hiding behind the sofa kind of thing to drink. I, um, when I was 12 years old, I went to one of those, you know, big Lottie Daw kind of parties, like, I don't know, it was a Deb party or something, but I was a guest of a friend, and um, she and I stole two bottles of champagne from the behind the open bar and went and hid under the stairs, and I drank mine, and then I drank half of hers, and I, for the first time in my life at 12 years old, got on that dance floor, and I felt confident, and I felt cute, and I felt lovable and I, I felt like I fit in and I felt comfortable in my own skin. And um, that was truly the first time I had ever felt that way. Now I, I remember my 10th birthday and um, it's all about me and sitting at the head of the table and everyone singing happy birthday and feeling completely alone. And you know that stuff was always with me, even well into my sobriety that loneliness was has been my Achilles heel up and you know up until a certain point but um so you know fast forward and and I start you know smoking cigarettes and um drinking in my bedroom on a regular basis you know I just took stuff from my parents my dad had taught me when I was a little kid probably five or six how to make him a gin martini every day 
and I would make my mom's gin and tonic and make his gin martini every day when he got home from work. And um, that was just kind of what we did. Um, they were, my parents were super high functioning. Um, my dad, when I first got sober, asked if he, if I thought he was an alcoholic. And I was like, well, I really don't know. I really can't answer that for you. I was like, you know, I guess if you're really asking, then yeah, I think you probably are. And he said, I do too. But quite frankly, I have more important things to worry about. And I'm like, okay, that's great. And he went to Al-Anon for a while and whatever, but, um, I've always been around drinking. It was just kind of normal. Um, and they didn't drink a ton, but they, they definitely drink, drank every day. Um, and so my thing was, you know, hiding booze under my bed and I would drink by myself, not necessarily every day by any means, but, um, you know, it started slowly and on the weekends or when I was feeling sad or when I was feeling left out and, um, I would, you know, drink a little bit and, and go to bed and I had this balcony outside of my bedroom where I could go out there and drink and there's trees everywhere and smoke and just kind of, you know, do my own thing. And, and that year, I guess that was around like seventh grade, it was, was a really hard year for me. It was a pivotal year in that, um, this is so dumb because it's so seventh grade. Um, but these, this girl blamed me for a rumor about some other girls. And I had nothing to do with it. But um, I got blamed for it. And for some reason, everybody turned on me. I started getting little, like, hate letters in class. And, um, you know, just mean. Girls can be very mean. I went to an all-girls private school for 14 years, and um, and it was hard. And I was crying every single day in school for four months. And um, and that was when you know drinking was really became my comfort, and it was something that I leaned on to make me feel okay. And kind of get me out of that pain. And um, eventually it came out that I had nothing to do with that and and found out who actually had something to do with that. And But she was too scary, and so no one did anything. And, <laughs> and nobody messed with her. And I was so mad about that. I was like, you know, what about, aren't, aren't we all going to turn on her now? You know, what's going on? What kind of business is this? But... Um, <laughs> That didn't happen, and um, and so it took a long time, even though the truth eventually came out, for people to kind of trust me again. It was like they, on some level, still believed that I had said this ridiculous thing, and so I I didn't have a whole lot of friends, like seventh, eighth, ninth grade. Um, they were just kind of around, and I would get invited places, but... But I didn't really feel close to very many people. You know, I had like my one person, and that was it. Um, and so, in those years, you know, I, I dove deeper into into drinking. But um, sophomore year in high school, I, I found myself a boyfriend, and um, all of a sudden, I had an identity. I was Nate's girlfriend, and it's like. It gave me some kind of confidence, you know, um, and and an identity. I mean, I, I already said that, but um, and he was into, you know, other things um, that are not alcohol, like primarily just, you know, smoking pot or whatever. And um, so that's when I started down that road. And um, I was with him for a couple of years, and until he went to college and. Um, I had, I drove around and drove this little sports car and always had a bottle of tequila in the trunk of my car. And I had one of those disgusting lemon juice things that the liquid lemon juice is just tastes wretched and a salt sh shaker. Like I know what I'm doing. So I like, I had my own little mini bar in my car that I would 
put a little towel over the console and set up my glass and all my stuff and I'd shoot tequila. And it's really hot in here. Um, I think I'm just nervous. Um, so, thanks, honey. Um, and then, and that was really after school and in the, you know, when, if I was going out in the evening and something to get me going so that I could be around other people. Because I really didn't feel comfortable going anywhere or doing anything unless I had something in my system to give me that confidence. Um, when I was 13 was the first time I started hurting myself. And, um, you know, it was one of those things where I believed I wanted to die. I wanted out. I wanted to kill myself. But I would, like, sterilize the knife before I'd start cutting myself so I don't get an infection. It's like... <laughs> It makes no sense. And my dad was a doctor, so I'm like, certainly I have to sterilize this before. You know. And um, he found me at one point. It was never anything super severe because, quite frankly, I was too chicken to actually do anything too serious. But um, that was when he um, put me in therapy for the first time. So I started seeing a psychiatrist. Um, uh, uh, that was the second time, actually, when I was 15. So, um, and that, I don't know, in a way kind of helped with some some self-awareness and self-knowledge, which um, kind of got me through for a period of time. Um, but um, I don't know. I think I just, I was always really sad. And... Um, you know, eventually the guy went off to college, he started seeing someone else, you know, I get my heart broken, all that kind of stuff, and um, just kind of pushed through. And I wasn't the nicest person in high school, um, and it's primarily because I was just so insecure and didn't like myself and didn't know myself and um, was scared of other people. But, you know, my sister you know, was three years older than me, and she had the right boyfriend, and she went to the right college, and she just kind of, you know, always got really good grades and, and all of that stuff, so I kind of always felt like I was a little bit in her shadow um, and just different, and I just didn't, it didn't make sense. Um, my mom, who's my best friend now, you know, by far, um, she slept all the time her escape was sleep. And so our house was always really quiet. Um, she would sleep every single day and you know, she always fed us. She picked us up from school. She got us to school. She did what she had to do. Otherwise she was in bed. My father was a cardiologist and he worked all the time. And so, you know, he'd come home, he'd have a drink, he'd eat dinner, he'd either go out or go back to work. Um, and he was usually gone in the morning before I got up. And we would never eat together. We ate on trays in front of different TVs in the house. Um, and so my, my house was always really quiet, really isolating, kind of walking past each other like ghosts in the hallway. Um, and so I think all of that contributed to that loneliness that plagued me for so long as well. Um, but I, um, I did okay. I got by. I finished high school and I went off to college and when I got there um, I realized I can do other things I can try other things nobody here knows me you know and I got into heavier drugs which I'll leave out the gory details but um, and that took me to a whole nother level uh, with with my using and with my escapism um, and after two years at that school, I kind of had burned my bridges. I had dated, um, you know, found my identity through various serial monogamous relationships, um, and kind of, I was done there. And I thought, well, this isn't working. These people are crazy. They're all sick. They're all on drugs. I need to get out of here. And so I transferred to a bigger school that that school had 1,700 people. This, the school I transferred to had 40,000. So I go there and I'm a junior in college and um, that was when all my self-righteousness of 
yeah, I'll do this, but I would never do that kind of stuff that I had sort of built around this, like, you know, the whole um, egomaniac with an inferiority complex thing. Um, and all of that kind of came to a head. And I was, um, I started dabbling in all of the things that I said I would never do. Um, and I didn't know one person at that school. So I got to be whoever I wanted to be. And one of my biggest things was really morphing myself and my personality into who I thought you wanted me to be. Um, you know, people pleasing is pretty common and I didn't really see it as that as much as just wanting to belong and wanting to be accepted and wanting to feel loved and having never really felt loved before in my life. Um, and, and it worked for a period and, and I, you know, followed a band around and sold grilled cheese out of the back of a van and, um, did all these things. And, um, and then I got into some heavier things that really took me down fast and, um, you know, things that allowed me to drink more. You know, if I do that, it kind of sobers me up and I can drink more and, um, failing out of school and all of those things. Um, and so when I was 21, I went, I, uh, I had one of those nights where the guy left me and was, you know, told me he was in love with someone else. And we go to this, everyone goes to this music festival. That's like a weekend long thing. And, um, he's with her and I'm devastated. And my two best friends were like the three musketeers. Well, they decide that they're going to start seeing each other. So all of a sudden I'm out. Um, and I'm sitting in this huge drum circle around a bonfire with a harvest moon rising. I had taken every drug I could get my hands on and I was sober as a log. I mean, technically you take my blood, I'm completely gone. But in my brain, I was, nothing was working. I could not get drunk. I could not get messed up no matter how hard I tried. And I got home at about seven or eight in the morning and I looked at myself in the mirror and I'm five, seven and I was 98 pounds. And, um, I just had that moment of clarity where God comes into my life or whatever it is. And I'm looking at myself in the mirror and I'm thinking, I can't do this anymore. Um, I don't want to live and I don't want to die and alcohol and drugs aren't working anymore. And I had nothing. I was completely dead inside. And um, whatever powers that be, I found the strength to call my mom. And I was in Georgia, and she was obviously here. And um, I gave her a call, and, and I said, Mom, I'm, I need help. I'm in trouble. And and I don't know what to do. And she said, she didn't even ask any questions. She just said, we're on our way. And, and it was just one of those God deals where that wasn't her, you know, normally she'd be like, well, what are you talking about? What happened? What are you doing? What's going on? You know, and all of that. And, and none of that came out of her mouth. It was just, we're on our way. And she and my dad and her dog, um, show up about six hours later and I picked them up at the airport and as soon as my father saw me he just crumbled and fell into a chair at the airport because he knew I mean they hadn't seen me in I don't know six months or so and but in that six months was when I just really tanked and lost all that weight um and um he couldn't handle it and about like the next morning he went back to Dallas because he just couldn't handle it. He couldn't fix it. He didn't know what to do. And I understand that. And it wasn't his fault. Um, my dad was raised in a really awful environment. Um, just his mom and never knew who his father was. And she was, um, horribly abusive. And so my dad had a lot of trauma. And so being around traumatic things and things that he couldn't control or fix was really hard for him. And um, so he left, and it was finals week. It was that was June second of '96, and 
my mom got me in with this oh, this woman. She was a therapist. She was awful, you guys. She was so mean to me and treated me like a junkie off the street that steals and I mean just the worst possible image of me she could have had and I'm like dude I'm wearing like diamonds and pearls I'm not a junkie I'm not selling my jewelry like my parents give me money I'm I'm kind of in a good spot that way and very fortunate so I don't know what you're talking about I'm the one that wants to stop doing this why are you treating me this way and she was just awful and I don't know why I share that with you but I just <laughs> maybe I still have a resentment there that I need to work on I don't know um, apparently and um, so I never saw her again um, but my mom stayed with me in my apartment I lived by myself and she stayed with me for the next um, week and a half and got me through finals cooked for me you know helped me study um, cleaned out all the stuff helped me get rid of all of my paraphernalia um, and she was really amazing and so strong and um, and I went home and um, for the summer I had intended to stay in Georgia and go to summer school because I went to summer school every year um, but I just and I actually I did I started summer school for about a month and then I was just going crazy you know you have that I wanted to get sober I can do this this is my choice you know all this like woohoo here we go um, and thinking you can take on the world and that all of those reasons why you drank and used are suddenly just gone because you put all the stuff down and I found out really quickly that that's not the case that the depression and the anxiety and the fear and the self-loathing and the all of those things just flooded back to me so about a month later you know my mom had left and I stayed out there and started summer school but about a month into it I was like I'm I'm going to hurt myself I'm going to do something that there's no coming back from and um, she put me in treatment here in Dallas and so I came home and moved in with um, my parents and started an outpatient treatment um, in 96 and I was there for about three months and um, and it, it was one of those things where I always admitted that I was a drug addict but I ever had a really difficult time admitting that I was an alcoholic because I never really liked the taste of alcohol um, and I didn't really like beer because it just I couldn't drink very much of it because it just filled me up and I felt like ick and so I just drank wild turkey I would drink double shots of wild turkey and I'd walk around with a diet coke all night and you know what are you drinking diet coke what are you drinking and then I sneak off to the bar and I'm like give me a chilled triple of wild turkey whoop okay what are you drinking diet coke what are you doing and, you know I mean I was always very secretive about my drinking um and I went into treatment and and that was the first time I was and I thought you know I I have an issue with depression I have an issue you know with drugs um but I got into um a treatment program here and and they introduced me to AA so my first meeting was at Preston Group in 90 in 90 like August of 96 so I had been sober about two months dry whatever you want to call it um, and I remember that first meeting and like I don't belong here but then I went and sat down and I listened and it was genuinely truly the first time in my life that I felt like understood I felt like oh shit I belong here <laughs> Um, but I still didn't accept, you know, the first step wholeheartedly into my heart in regards to alcohol. Um, I stayed, I tried to go back to school in Georgia after treatment, but I just couldn't do it. And so I packed up my stuff and moved home and, um, 
because my support system was here, you know, the girls from treatment and, you know, I had a sponsor. Um, and as soon as I moved back home, I got myself a little boyfriend in the program. And there's my identity. There's my confidence. There's my boost. Um, I don't need to work with a sponsor. I'm good. And, you know, I, I already worked the steps in treatment. I'm, I'm good, you know. Um, and I stayed clean for a little over two years and um, stayed, you know, in that same relationship with him. And, and one day, you know, I had, I had decided that I was going to try to drink again. As long as I stay away from drugs, I'll be okay. And he took me, and he was sober, mind you, he took me to the liquor store, and I went in and I bought one Rolling Rock beer, which I never drank Rolling Rock. I never even really drank beer. I'm like, what am I doing? So I, I get back in his car. We drive to the Galleria. I drink the beer on the way. I'm crying the whole time. We get out, and, and that was the moment, you know, when I, when I took that drink again, where in that whole two-year period, I never really felt the presence of God in my life or in my heart. Um, but in that moment that I drank again, I felt him leave. You know, really it was me leaving, obviously, but my perception at the time was I felt him leave. And that was what the tears were about. Um, and we got to the gallery, and I had finished my beer. I got out of the car, and I smashed the bottle against the wall. And I was just mad. And then we went shopping. Because, <laughs> you know, if you need something to fix you, it's going to be what? It's gonna be alcohol, drugs, smoking, sex, shopping, food. I picked shopping. Um, <laughs> And I didn't drink again for another three weeks or so. And I see, I can control this. I don't have an obsession. I don't need to drink anymore. And went out, you know, one of those holiday type, you know, back to school kind of things at Stonely P with a bunch of people from high school and um, had a glass of wine while I was sitting there. And I had my girlfriend with me that was, had been my best friend since we were four years old. But she was always normal too. She never really got into anything that I was into, but we always spent all of our time together. Um, she was ready to go home. She was tired, and I said, okay, and so I took her home, and I went back to the bar, and, and I, it's kind of like one of those things, you have a head full of AA, you've listened for two years, and you're like, I'm watching myself whirl and go down this slide, and I'm like, oh, here we go. I'm, I'm going, and I got to do this, you know, and I went back to the bar, and it was the first night I'd ever blacked out. I rarely, I never blacked out before, and I think it's because I was on so many drugs that for some reason they kept me from blacking out, and, and that was the first night that I blacked out, and that really scared me, um, but I thought, well, you know, I'm here, I'm in it, I'm just going to I'm just going to ride this out for a couple of months. And um, I went, went out with, with some people again, like the next, a couple days later. And, and I stayed after they left. And, um, and I drank all the way through the night and got up in the morning and I started drinking again. And the next thing I know, I'm kind of coming to, and I'm in the airport, I'm on an airplane, I'm going to Georgia. I got a ticket, I'm on the plane, and I'm like, you know, I had to look in my bag to see where I was going, you know, and it was weird and surreal, and um, when I got off the plane, my two best friends from college were waiting for me, so I had arranged a ride, you know, I was very responsible. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I had everything figured out. And I think the reason I went back to Georgia was because I knew where to get safe drugs. I knew I had my contacts there still. I knew, you know, who to go to where I would be safe, if there's any such thing. Um, and I thought, well, I'm here. And I was there for the weekend, and I just blew it out. 
And I was like, you know, maybe I'll get it together when I get back home. And the whole weekend was awful. All of those feelings of loneliness, all of that self-loathing and all of that, this is just the worst, comes back and floods back. And, and I go home and, um, and smoked my last bowl. And, and the next morning, um, I was done. That was it. I surrender. Um, and I went to a meeting. And, um, and that was on September 25th of 98. And, you know, this program is so true for me that it's not for people who need it. It's for people who want it. And I had to want it. I had to believe that this is where I belonged and, and have that desperation, that gift that, you know, of hopelessness, um, to really surrender and, and dive wholeheartedly into this program. Um, and I got a sponsor and she was, um, she was one of those kind of hardcore AAs, kind of, kind of a big B, you know, a little bit mean. Um, and she was perfect for me. You know, I needed someone that was going to be a little blunt and a little honest with me. And, um, but of course, you know, I get 30 days and get myself a boyfriend with 15 years of sobriety. Can anyone say 13th step? Um, <laughs> but that was the 13th step. Um, and, you know, kind of fell back into my old patterns and I was really working the steps with, with my sponsor and I was, you know, that was always my little shortcoming area. Um, but he and I got into it and it didn't have the best relationship and um, all hell breaks loose. And I had done my, I had just finished my fifth step. I had three months sober and I had just finished my, you know, 42 page front and back fifth step that took nine hours with my sponsor, God bless her, and completely raw, completely vulnerable, get into it with the boyfriend because you know, when you're that raw, I mean, if you want to see your defects, get in a relationship, right? Um, and she, I was, I called her to vent and she couldn't deal with it. And she hung up on me and I've never seen her or spoken to her since. I have no idea what happened to her. Um, and it broke my heart, but it was absolutely the best thing that could have happened for my sobriety because I realized that she was my higher power. I put so much faith in everything dependency on her. It, it really wasn't healthy. And, and, it, and it truly humbled me to my knees where I was forced to find a God of my understanding or die. Um, I quickly got another sponsor, started over, went through the sp steps again, um, and, and things were really good, you know, um, and, and sobriety has been absolutely the best thing that's ever happened in my life, um, next to my daughter. And, um, and I really found myself. And I think I was raised in a family where, you know, they sent us to Sunday school just because they had to, but they didn't go to church. They didn't really believe in anything like that. Um, I was exposed to a little bit of religion, but it was just never a part of my life. Um, and that was a good thing too. I didn't have any preconceived notions of what God was supposed to be. And, and in the beginning, God for me was the ocean and nature and things that were bigger than me um, because I, I didn't even know how to pray. You know, my sponsor's like, let's get on our knees and pray. And I'm like, I don't know what to say. You know, I didn't know how to do that. Um, and, you know, being completely open to something is, um, is still, you know, such a gift 
you know, that, that I wasn't fighting it where I could have. Um, and that sponsor ultimately went back out. You know, she had 12 years, I think, and she went back out. Um, and that was okay because she wasn't my higher power. But, you know, and that stuff happens. All of us are human. We're all fallible, you know. Um, and, and it was just another lesson in putting my dependence in God and not a sponsor or a man or whatever. Um, and those lessons were really valuable in my journey. Um, when I hooked up with, um, with another sponsor and she was my sponsor for, I don't know, almost 15 years. Um, and, and she was amazing. And the one thing that plagued me through that whole first 14 years of my sobriety was loneliness. It's, it was always my Achilles heel. I'd work the steps on it every single time. It was always a part of my step work. And, and it, it maybe got a little bit better, but it just, you know, and I still had that sort of self-loathing. And Christy, y'all know Christy, was my sponsor. And she would always say to me, Evan, how long are you going to pick up a half-eaten hot dog and a stale bag of Doritos? How long are you going to keep doing that in reference to, like, guys? Um, to fix you, the half-eaten hot dog and the stale bag of Doritos, and I'm like, I, hot dogs are okay, you know, I don't know, <laughs> so, um, but she's like, open the door, there's a buffet available to you, there's everything you could ever imagine and want in life available to you, quit picking up the damn stale Doritos, and I'm like, I, and she must have said that to me for seven or eight years before I finally put the hot dog down. Um, <laughs> that sounded really bad. Um, sorry. So uh, <laughs> when I was 14 years sober, I, I hit a really, really dark place in my sobriety. Um, three members of my family were in the hospital. Uh, my sister almost died. Um, my father was dying. My grandmother was dying. And I've always been super close with my family, especially since treatment and being in the program and all the amends and everything coming out, you know, it heals your family. Um, and I had to go to New York for work. At the time, I owned a toy store. And I was going to Toy Fair in New York, and I thought, I can't go. Everyone's dying. I mean, they're all, like, basically in rooms next to each other. Um, my sister had a freak accident, and lost 30% of her blood and um, almost died. And um, my grandmother had metastasized breast cancer that had come back and she was dying. And, and my father had a slew of health problems that went on for, you know, we're in and out of the hospital for 12, 13 years. Um, and my mom was supposed to go with me to New York on that trip. And, and she stayed behind, and, and I, she's like, you just need to go. Just go. Just get out of here. And I'm like, okay. So I went, and I was sitting in my hotel room, and conveniently, they don't, you know, you, can't, you can only open the windows this much because they don't want you to jump. And um, that was a blessing. I was sitting there smoking cigarettes out this little, you know, crack in my window, and just back to that same feeling of when I first got sober, feeling dead inside again, feeling really lonely, feeling really sad, feeling like I, I had already gone to five funerals that year of close friends and, you know, people that I loved. I lost three of my pets in that same year, um, three out of four. And it was just one of those devastating years. Nothing was going right. And um, and I was just started praying and, and I remember praying, you know, I'm either going to kill myself or I'm going to dive into this program again. And for whatever reason, meditation was the answer. And I dove into like guided meditations, like 60 straight days of guided meditation 
and on my knees every you know morning and night again all the back to basic stuff um reaching out getting honest with somebody um you know my dad did die and um and that was it's like you're ready because you think you're ready because he's been sick for so long but then it happens and you're like i wasn't ready you know um And it's still really hard. I mean, it's been eight years. Um, And he died, and um, that changed me. All of a sudden, I knew what I was worth. And, you know, I was 38 years old, I guess, and, um, and... and I just wasn't going to wait around for anyone else to make my life happen for me anymore. You know, it was up to me. It was up to my attitude. Um, six months later, my grandmother died and she was my best friend. And, um, um, it was just a really painful year. And, I decided that I was going to have a baby and I wasn't going to wait for anyone to make my life happen. And I signed up for all of that, did the match.com for sperm. Um, Mom and I had a really good time shopping for that for a couple of months. Um, I went through the whole process and of course, you know, infertility. And Uh, you got less than 1% of chance of ever having a child of your own. And that's devastating. And I met, um, and at that time, I had already met my husband. I met him at No Hassle. And he had periodically sent me a little cheeseburger emoji, like every three or four months. I know it's weird. There's a story to it. I won't bore you with that. He'd send me this little cheeseburger emoji. It was just kind of like a little, you know, flirting thing. And I'd like, hi, with like a hand, you know, the hand that goes like, and I'd send that back. And then I wouldn't hear from him for three months. And I just wasn't, I wasn't interested, you know. I was in a, another cluster with someone that was totally unavailable because it was safe and I didn't have to deal with anything. And I'm trying to get pregnant and I'm doing all these shots, you know, for times a day and all the stuff and um and finally I gave this guy a chance and we went out and um from from that day we we were inseparable and two months later we were engaged and uh at seven months we got married and three months after we got married we got pregnant and you know, they said, you can't have kids. And I'm here to tell you that that's up to God. And she's an absolute miracle. Um, And she's everything. And um, Mike and I work together now. We have three businesses and... um, and we are together a lot, probably too much. We, we occasionally try to kill each other. Um, but in the last year, um, things have really shifted. And I think before we got together and started dating, was I was finally in my heart okay with not having someone else, with just being me with doing what I needed to do, doing what I wanted to do, doing, you know, what I felt God was compelling me to do. And, and I think at that time when I truly was okay with me is when all of these other things were allowed into my life. You know, my husband, my daughter, my career, um, he and I started a construction company and, um, right before we got married. And then, uh, last year I started a landscaping company and, um, this year has been huge because he and I, he's Cuban and he and I 
embarked on kind of a new spiritual path. And it's, um, we've really rediscovered ourselves. He's rediscovered his culture and where he came from. And initially I was doing it to, you know, I was curious, but I was being supportive. And, and then the power of what we've experienced um, through this spiritual path has just completely transformed me um, and given me so much confidence and strength and trust and faith in God. And, you know, these things ebb and flow. You know, sometimes you feel really connected, sometimes you don't. Um, but God's always there, and I know that I'm the one that needs to turn in the right direction to be close to him again. Um, and, you know, recently I, I've had health problems for years and years and years, and um, all the stuff, and just chronic fatigue and all the stuff. And I, I dove into my nutrition back in June and, um, you know, found some things that have absolutely changed my life. And given me energy and I've lost 24 pounds since June and and I feel like I'm getting my life back and I'm taking care of myself and I'm you know putting myself first so that I can be more available to my family and to my daughter my daughter has special needs she's high functioning autism and she has hypotonia which makes balance and controlling her throat and all of the other stuff hard for her um, and that's challenging. So, you know, we're running three businesses and raising a special needs little girl. And um, in 2019, we lost our house in the tornado. And there's nothing like getting your roof ripped off over your head while you're under the stairs on top of your three-year-old um, to kind of knock some sense into you. But, and that's been a really rocky, difficult road. And we finally got back in our house in February. It took a year and a half. Um, we're still dealing with it. Insurance didn't pay all the blah, blah, blah. Um, and it's, you know, my point being life is still happening. People are still dying. I was married once before in sobriety. We were only married for two years and we got divorced, divorced in sobriety, you know, death, losing friends, you know, sad things happening. Um, and that's just the way it is, but I've never felt the need or compelled to drink again or use again or turn to that to escape. Um, you know, occasionally I'll pick up a cigarette or I'll go shopping, but those are far less um, severe consequences than picking up a drink because I know what happens when I do that. Um, my life is infinitely better. Like I feel I found things that I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about my company, I'm passionate about the nutrition I'm using, I'm passionate about my family, my daughter, um, and, you know, living my best life. And I'm passionate about my spirituality again, and that's such a gift. And, um, you know, building my little nest and my little home and my little, you know, world. And, and the loneliness is gone. And it was gone before Mike and I got together. And, and I think it's because I really surrendered to it and I really accepted it. And I read a book, and this is kind of the last thing I'll say, but a long time ago, I want to say it was Anthony DeMello or Awareness or some, something along those lines. I, I can't remember which book it was that I read this in, but it really stuck with me was to not define yourself by your feelings. You know, I was always saying, I have depression. I am lonely. I feel miserable. You know, uh, my life sucks. Um, all these things that defined my experience and my world. And instead of using those words to say, I experience depression sometimes. I Sometimes I don't feel good, but for the most part, I'm OK. Um, I had to have the biggest surgery in the history of ever um, <laughs> three years ago, and but that's okay. It's not who I am. The loneliness is not who I am. The loneliness is not who God set me up to be. Who I am is my spirit, my heart, my morals, my my drive, my 
my soul. Um, it's not the depression. It's not the feelings. Those feelings are temporary, and they don't have to define me. And I think when I realized that, uh, they went away, and I realized I'm okay, and I'm worthy, and you know, I I am exactly where I'm supposed to be, and I have a lot of work still to do, and things are not always easy, but they are doable and the support I have in these rooms and outside of these rooms um, is incomparable to anything else. I mean, I feel so blessed that I get to be a part of this. Um, and I'm, I'm so thankful to be here and for you guys listening and um, bearing with me. I was a little nervous, but, and Mo, thank you so much for thinking of me and inviting me. And I've always just admired you so much, um, you know, in your journey and, and seeing you go through the ups and downs of life and, and staying sober through it. And, and it's people like that, that when you see people come in and they're in pain and they're going through things that you realize, Hey, it's okay. I can come in here and be in pain and I'm going to be okay. And we can all get through it together. So I'm really grateful um, for this program and for you guys. And thank you for letting me share.